everyone. Thanks for having us. We will have a conversation about AI, but first, I would like to know the audience's perception about this topic. So please raise your hand if you think that AI, generative AI, such as ChatGPT, is something, it's a new hype. It's just a fact. Please raise your hand. <laughs> and please raise your hand if you believe Generative AI is something real, it's here to stay. Okay, we, ha we have a winner. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to do the same question for our speakers, but uh, I would like just to remember that two years ago, we were talking about NFTs, non-fungible tokens. Then we started to talk about Metaverse when Zuckerberg rebranded Facebook as Meta. And now we are talking about generative AI. Why this time is different? How to believe in AI? Ichasa. OK, um, I can talk a little bit. I'm not really sure if I can say if it is a, a hype or it's not a hype. Definitely, we've seen uh, Notion. Notion Capital is an investor. We are based in London, and we are investing in, in, in B2B cloud uh, businesses. So it's nothing to do with the no taking up which has the same name uh, and, and came a little bit after and is using generative AI too. But uh, we see a lot of founders coming to us and, and, and pitching uh, opportunities with generative AI. What I do think is in many cases is in some of the ones that you <coughs> mentioned, there is a, a little bit of a gap between the, uh, the reality of what a technology can do and, and, and uh, what people want to do with that technology, right? And if we think, you, you just mentioned some examples, but uh, think of autonomous vehicles, how much money investors threw into autonomous vehicles in 2015, 16. And at that time, we were expecting that technology to be developed fairly quickly and to be able to come to the Web Summit today in a car which had no driver, right? But that's clearly, uh, it's not the case, which means that um, at that point, we're expecting the technology to deliver some KPIs that are not at the time frame of an investor. This is different with generative AI. We can see that the technology today is, is uh, delivering KPIs and performance and, and results that are already useful for us, which means that we can integrate them in our workflows and we can uh, think of applications in which we can make the most of generative AI already today. So that's why I do think that it is not such a hype, but rather much more of a reality. We will need to see where we get with that, but I do think we are definitely closer to deliver a, a good, uh, good results and technologies that are useful for us. Daniela, what do you think? I, I, I usually say that AI go, uh, the time evolution in AI is just like the seasons in Game of Thrones. You go from long winters, short summers, and in this case, this one is different because of this summer uh, is different and it's probably longer because we've never seen so much investment in AI uh, than now. Last year alone in the United States, we had 93.5 billion between private and public sector, which doubled from the year before. We have the European Commission investing one billion a year from uh, between, until now in the next 10 years between the Digital Europe and Horizon Europe programs. And that's the European Commission. You, but on the other hand side, you actually see less, uh, you see 1,050 companies in 2021 invested versus 746 in the United States in 2022. So you're seeing bigger investments in less um, entities. So this, this is, I believe it's here to stay. There's something different now. Ben? Yeah, I think there, there of course, is a lot of hype around AI, and people will say some things that go beyond, go beyond the reality and don't make sense. But by and large, it's also clear 
generative AI is a working functional technology that's already delivering value to a great number of people. It's, it's not yet artificial general intelligence. It likely can serve as one component of artificial general intelligence systems. And I think it's, it's really worth positioning it in the, the rise of AI over a substantial period of time, right? I mean, the field of AI was started in the 1950s. The first neural nets were sort of designed on paper in the late 1940s. In the early 70s, when I was a kid, I remember reading a book called The Prometheus Project, which said in the next few decades, we're going to get machines smarter than people. We're, we're, we're going to be able to prolong human life indefinitely. And we're going to build machines that are so small you can't see them operating at the nanoscale. So the potential of these things has been clear quite some time. Now, Ray Kurzweil in the late 90s started writing books like The Age of Spiritual Machines, projecting exponential increase in AI capabilities going along with the exponential improvement of computational power. And by and large, this is what's happened, right? I mean, it's, it's easy to get caught up in ups and downs of things. You could look at, say, U.S. stock market since World War II on the whole has done pretty well. But if you're following your portfolio every day, you know, it's maybe going, going up, up, up and down. So I think in, in hindsight, when our, our machine descendants and our, our cyborg descendants are looking back, it's going to look actually like a pretty steady r rise, rise of the AI. And we're going to see, you know, computer vision started advancing tremendously 2014 or so, starting with AlexNet, then the rollout of, of face recognition. Natural language processing started, you know, booming a lot, starting with the, with the, the, the BERT model in 2017-18, now accelerated with ChatGPT. And I think it, within a few years from now, we're going to see the initiation of another burst of progress, which is you know, fuller artificial general intelligence systems, which is, is the focus of, of, of my own work. So there's, there's some hype, but there's a lot of reality here. And what we're mm -hmm. seeing is one, one burst of genuine advance in a series of genuine advances in the AI field. Daniela, AI, generative AI is one type of AI and one type of technology. What about the combination uh, with other technologies or other AIs? I, I think AI is the, is the next industrial revolution, is, in, is what some people say, Industry 5.0. So it's really pervasive to every industry sector. It will be just like the internet, just like uh, before the Industrial Revolution, the invention of the printing back in the, in the 16th century. It's that type of revolution that's going to affect everyone. So, and, and you know, it's going to be, you, you see it first in actually unstructured data and unstructured application, uh, applications that are based in unstructured data, just like natural language processing, com conversational AI, computer vision, multi-model, which I mean, multi-model in itself, GPT-4, bringing that combination seems new, but it's actually been in, in research for the last 20 years at least. But it's been done at scale for now, for the first time. But that's the thing. It's the layer that is going to be just like the Web3 next will be pervasive across every industry. And Ben, what about the combination of blockchain and AI or when we're going to see generative AI embedded in robots? Well, I think generative AI, it's an important piece of the story. If you look at human intelligence, I mean, generating cool stuff is one of the things we do. We also do a lot of other things. I mean, we reason, we compare what we generate to reality, we evaluate, we maintain goals, and we're agents acting in the world, and we generate in, in that context. I think in the next few years, we're going to see connection of generative AI systems with other sorts of AI modules that do reasoning, evaluation against, against fact, that do sort of evolution, which leads to new forms of fundamental creativity, which have more of an agentic aspect and a control system. And you, 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 you're going to see connection of multiple AI modules where generative AI is, is a piece of the picture. And this brings up the question of 
who's combining all, all these pieces? Is it all happening within one large company that designed all these pieces? Or could you have one company create a generative AI, one create a reasoning system, you know, one, one, one company create a simulation engine, right? And, and they're integrated together. And if you want to integrate together multiple complex software modules, be they AI modules or anything else, in a way that isn't owned and controlled by, by one party, but is decentralized in its fundamental control, this is what blockchain fundamentally does, right? I mean, blockchain isn't fundamentally about digital money, though that's one interesting application. Blockchain is fundamentally about allowing networks of software processes to coordinate in a decentralized way without a central controller. This becomes quite interesting when you look at, at, at the future of AI, right? Because, I mean, one question is, will generative AI take you all the way to AGI, or do you need to sort of combine it with other modules, which is what I think, and I'm working on it in Singularity Net Ecosystem. The other question is, who owns and controls this thing, right? I mean, ultimately, presumably it owns and controls itself once you're past the singularity, but in the, in the interim period, who owns and controls it? Is it a government, is it a big company, or is it a decentralized network? And who do we want to own and control it? What, what, what mode of control and ownership will make us us better off. My, my, my view on that is probably evident, but there's other perspectives as well. Okay. Itchas, as an investor, where do you see the opportunities in the artificial intelligence market? So just a, co a comment on that and okay, on the question. No it looked like one of the pitches that we see usually where you throw all the words into it, right? It's like at, at the blockchain with generative AI, mm -hmm. with NFTs, you know, and everything on the same pitch deck when they come to pitch to us. Um, so we got to be a little bit careful uh, because obviously we've seen an increase of generative AI coming through the door, companies uh, trying to use it uh, to raise money. And I think there are a couple of things that uh, personally I'm really interested and, and curious to know from the entrepreneurs that come to Beach. One is what are the language models that they are building on top of the I mean, the, the, the general uh, language models, so they can be verticalized, for example, and you can build some uh, generative AI solutions for fintech or uh, healthcare or legal, right? And, and so you build um, a unique uh, value through those. So that's one of the ways. The second one is, and I am uh, personally very product driven, so very much concerned of those products that we are building that take uh, users, business users in my case, out of their workflows just for the use of generative AI. So I do look a lot at applications in which generative AI is completely embedded on the workflows and doesn't take uh, business users out of their workflows, right? So those little things are things that we are looking at where we will not invest in, for example, is in generative AI solutions which are looking for a specific facts uh, because it has been proven that in fact those language models cannot provide those uh, facts. And so we are very conscious on, on analyzing, looking first on the product side, the workflows, and then on the language models that sit on top of those, uh, the generative AI uh, so that they can build uh, unique uh, selling points and value propositions and they get a competitive advantage by building those, those models on top of those, I would say. Okay, I have another common question for you. Uh, what do you think about big techs? Do you think they are gonna still lead this process or we're gonna have space to small companies, for instance? Daniela, please. <laughs> that's, a, that's a tricky question that I have opinions about. We do, if you look at this wave of generative AI, uh, it takes, GPT-3 alone took 100, takes 175 billion parameters running on what's estimated uh, latest uh, news on, on GPT-4, on uh, $700,000 a day to run in computing, pow in computing uh, power. N let alone the data aspect, uh, our company is it deals, is, we, we are the largest marketplace of training data for AI. We know the price of data. 
when we pay people and, the, and when everything is legally done and consented. So when you, look, when you look at that, how many entities can really afford building generative AI? Now, the, what, what you have to, as an organization, have to decide is, am I going to build or buy? Not everybody needs to build, but there's a risk by leaving a monopoly of investment on the hands of a few, which is why the uh, President Biden created the uh, National Artificial Intelligence Task Force, was to precisely minimize the gap between the very wealthy universities and research centers and companies versus the, 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 the ones that cannot afford even to run uh, a GPU. So uh, the US government is investing 2.6 billion to kind of reach that gap. But it's, I mean, if you compare to the 93.5 billion um, that, that is invested last year alone in the private sector, and it's really divided by a few, that's a very different problem. Can I chip into yeah. that? Because uh, prior to Notion, in fact, I ran the investments for Microsoft in Europe. And so there were many businesses that were a little bit cautious um, coming to tell me about their technology because they thought we were going to, to copy it or something like that. And I, I tell you, I have no doubt small businesses are much more agile and, and flexible and they move, move much faster and there are things that would would be impossible to be built I inside these big organizations. And they will definitely fail on developing the products that externally they can be built. And I think Microsoft is a great example of that. I feel incredibly proud for having worked for, uh, for that organization, for Satya, and the mentality of acquiring businesses and, in fact, keeping them separate, in many cases, of the main corporation because of the the, the difficulties to maintain the good products and the good um, development or, or the future of those products. And those are the GitHub, the LinkedIn of the world, all of those. So I, I'm a big believer of uh, small businesses building technologies and absolutely being acquired in the future. So I will absolutely encourage all the entrepreneurs to continue working on it because I have no no uh, hope on big corporates developing many of those internally, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> and Bam, please. Yeah, I mean, there, there's no doubt that at the moment, big tech companies have a huge role in, in pushing forth generative AI, although smaller companies doing op open source stuff, such as uh, Stable Diffusion, uh, Eleuther, Anthropic, and so forth, are, are also, also in, the, in the running. But things can shift very quickly, like the closer we get to the singularity, the more you can expect things to rearrange themselves rapidly. And you know, I remember when people were saying open source could never work, big companies would always own operating systems, but Linux is number one operating system in the world, not owned or controlled by, by any big company. It's true, training generative AI models takes a lot of processing power, so does running Bitcoin, Ethereum, or Cardano networks. That's not done by any monolithic company, that's done by a huge amount of, of you know, server farm operators and individuals around the world. So I think, I think what it would take to break the oligopoly of big tech over generative AI is very simple. Someone who's not in a big tech company launches the next thing that's much smarter than what big tech companies have, have, have launched, right? And I don't think, yeah, a lot of computers, a lot of data are valuable, but that's not the only thing. There, there's still a value to having, having the right algorithms and, and, and the right AI approach. So, I mean, what, what we're pushing for in Singularity in that ecosystem and in our various little companies in that domain, like, a, Zarka, which is building neural symbolic language models, True AGI is doing integrated AI for enterprise and so forth. And what we're after there is make a system that's twice as smart as ChatGPT by combining generative AI with logical reasoning, evolutionary learning, and so forth. And actually, we've got a team working on this in Belo Horizonte, along with our other, our other global teams, led by Andre Senna, who's been working with me there since 1998 or so on, on, on related things. So, you know, if you can, if me, or my team, or somebody else who we've never heard of makes something twice as smart as ChatGPT, rolls it out 
in a decentralized open source way outside the big tech companies, there's not that much loyalty in the world these days, right? So I think that there's a bit of a lead in big tech in some ways right now, but the story is, is far from over. Okay. Ben, Daniela, Echasa, thank you. Thank you.